Good morning. Good morning. Glad you're here this morning, wherever you are, uh, on your couch, sitting on the couch. I hope you're not laying in bed, but, you know, I'm not judging here. But anyways, uh, so glad that you're with us. And uh, I hope you are enjoying the morning already. What a gorgeous morning out there. It is marvelous. And uh, open those windows up, let the, the nice air come through and enjoy it and hear those birds chirping. And uh, it is a wonderful day, maybe a good day to go for that little jaunt, that little walk to help you get motivated again, all right? I could take six more months of this, no problem. Six more months, all right? Uh, at any rate, this is time to kind of uh, greet each other, virtual handshaking as such. And uh, I'm going to go through some reminders with you. So uh, do your thing. Say hello to everybody. Uh, so kids, look for the bee. All right. He's out there somewhere. We changed up our scene here a little bit, as you can tell. Uh, so see if you can find the bee. And then do your little <clears throat> sheet, kids, and send it in to me. And uh, you've been having some really good uh, in participation with that. And uh, so keep it up. Send me your picture of what you did, and uh, we're keeping record. Mrs. Alcock is keeping record, and you don't get nothing by her, okay? Don't happen. So, uh, right, send it in to us, and uh, we'll mark it down. And when we get back together, you come see me in my office, and it'll be good times, all right? So we look forward to that. Um, and then Legacy Baptist Church family, you know, uh, you can give uh, via Tithely. <clears throat> You can mail it in, uh, and if that doesn't work for you, you can contact us, see about dropping off at the church. Uh, we are down there occasionally. Uh, uh, we can help with that, or you can drop it off to one of us. Uh, Pastor Matt is really helping in that area. Uh, so we're willing to work with you, try to help you out every way we can. So just so you know about that. Uh, and then next week is Mother's Day, next Sunday. Uh, so make sure you're getting the goodies off to mom. Uh, if you can and encourage her and that's a wonderful thing and we look forward to next Sunday Pastor Matt's going to be bringing this to word and uh, so we look forward to that as well and then if any of you in our church are graduating from high school or you finish a post-secondary program course degree uh, please let us know okay so message the church facebook message email text myself pastor matt uh we want to honor you that'll take place in june uh but hey better to ask some questions now and uh, try to get that all compiled uh so sooner the better you can let us know about that we would appreciate it and uh we look to having a special time to acknowledge you if it's via the digital realm what we are right now so be it we'll still do it uh but uh we just want to encourage you as well keep up the good work all right, and then uh, keep reaching out to others, uh, encouraging our seniors and those vulnerable, your neighbors, maybe not even vulnerable, just, you know, we're all feeling uh, the effects of quarantine. Uh, it's 40-something days now. It's getting close to 50. Uh, like, this is, woo, it's something else. Uh, so uh, let's just be contacting each other, encouraging each other best we can. And uh, I had a few curbside visits this week, and it did the heart good to see folks and uh, and just have a little chat uh, at a distance. Didn't disobey any rules from on high or anything. Uh, so at any rate, uh, you know, see if you can't do that. I know that'd be a blessing to others as well. And then um, let's be continue to pray for our healthcare professionals, folks in our church. Uh, who are involved with that particularly we know them uh, and serving uh, vulnerable people and in the hospitals themselves uh, so let's be praying for them and uh, looking to the Lord uh, to uh, give them the strength the wisdom that they need and then uh, let's be uh, praying for our leaders there's talks of you know I think tomorrow some shops are going to be reopening and things so a lot of big decisions that lay at their feet uh, so uh, let's uh, be keeping them in our prayers and uh, just encouraging uh, our leaders the best you can. You can reach out to them. You can tell them, hey, I'm praying for you. You can send a message about that. That's no problem. 
obviously you need to be praying. Uh, don't don't lie about it. But uh, uh, send them a message. Say, hey, I'm praying for you. I appreciate all you've done. Or uh, ask the Lord to give you wisdom. Uh, you know, whatever the case, it, it's a very good thing. Uh, and uh, hey, it's just another testimony for Jesus Christ. So you know, if you haven't done that, I encourage you to do that. Uh, let's continue to pray for Conchita. She is improving, so praise the Lord for that. The fever seems to have subsided, uh, so that's a wonderful thing to hear. So I'll continue praying. I pray for Brother Mark as well. And then this morning, just before I got on, I got a message that uh, Roger Galar is not feeling so good, so uh, vertigo. So we need to pray for him too. So uh, before we go any further, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for another day you've given to us. And Lord, thank you for... Uh, all your blessings, and Lord, I pray that you encourage us this morning, and Lord, uh, from your word, and Lord, I pray for those who are serving us in a, a very uh, selfless manner uh, with our medical professionals. Uh, Lord, I pray you protect them, help them uh, do a great job for your honor and glory, and Lord, for our frontline workers, those who are continue to you know, help with the grocery stores, uh, whatever it is, Lord, uh, just give them the strength they need to. Uh, it can be intimidating, a little scary. Uh, Lord, I pray you just give them the strength, help them a great testimony as well in their workplaces. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would uh, encourage Conchita right now. Uh, Lord, help her to be, to be strengthened, uh, Lord, and getting back to more normal health, Lord. I pray you just watch over her. Pray for Brother Roger as well. Uh, Lord, help him with this vertigo. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, encourage his uh, heart and, Lord, and, and strengthen his body. And Lord, we do uh, want to remember uh, our military as well with the loss of uh, six precious souls this week. Lord, I pray that you will be with them, uh, Lord, with the crew of that uh, naval ship and uh, the Fredericton. Uh, Lord, I pray that you just watch over them. Lord, allow them to be looking to you. Uh, Lord, I pray that there be a testimony for you there. And Lord, I pray that you bless this service now in a great and mighty way. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, I did forget one thing, hot off the wires, as they would say in the newsroom, all right? It's, it's right here, hot off, hot off the wires, all right? So, Michelle, really appreciated all the ladies sending in your favorite verses and things, and she says, thank you very much, but if you haven't, you still have time to do it, so please do. Uh, so this is the real hot information, okay? <clears throat> it's May 13th, 6 p.m., Ladies Bible study is a go. It's on. So just so you know, we'll put that all in the announcements, but she just gave that to me just before we started. So that's why. I think it's a good part. All right. Uh, let's uh, sing here. Now we're going to just, just like his great love. That's the first one we're going to start off with. Jesus, whose love is strong and true, and never fails howe'er tis tried, no matter what I do. I've sinned against this love of His, but when I knelt to pray, confessing all my guilt to Him, the sin clouds rolled away. It's just like Jesus to roll the clouds away. It's just like Jesus to keep me day by day. It's just like Jesus all along the way. It's just like his great love. Sometimes when clouds of trouble cloud out the sky above, I cannot see my Savior's face, I doubt his wondrous love, but he from heaven's mercy seat, beholding my despair, in love removes the clouds between, and shows me he is there. It's just like Jesus to roll the clouds away. Like Jesus, keep me day by day. Just like Jesus all along the way. 
It's just like His great love. Oh, I could sing forever of Jesus' love divine, of all His care and tenderness for this for life of mine. His love is in and over all, and wind and waves obey. When Jesus whispers, peace be still, and rolls the clouds away, it's just like Jesus to roll the clouds away. It's just like Jesus to keep me day by day. It's just like Jesus all along the way. It's just like his great love. All right, uh, I just keep trusting my Lord. <laughs> Just keep trusting my Lord as I walk along. I just keep trusting my Lord and he gives us song. Though the storm clouds darken the sky or the heavenly trail, I just keep trusting my Lord he will never fail. He's a faithful friend, such a faithful friend. I can count on him to the very end. Though the storm clouds darken the sky or the heavenly trail, I just keep trusting my Lord, he will never fail. All right, constantly abiding. Constantly abiding. There's a peace in my heart that the world never gave. A peace it cannot take away. Though the trials of life may surround like a cloud, I'm a peace that has come there to stay. Constantly abiding, Jesus is mine. Constantly abiding, rapture divine. He never leaves me lonely, whispers oh so kind. I will never leave thee, Jesus is mine. All the world seems to sing of a Savior and King when peace sweetly came to my heart. Troubles all fled away, and my night turned to day. Bless Jesus, how glorious Thou art. Oh, Constantly abiding, Jesus is mine. Constantly abiding, rapture divine. He never leaves me lonely, whispers all so kind. I will never leave thee. Jesus is mine. This treasure I have in a temple of clay while here on his footsteps.
stool I roll. He's coming to take me some glorious day over there to my heavenly home. Constantly abiding, Jesus is mine. Constantly abiding, rapture divine. He never leaves me lonely, whispers oh so kind. I will never leave thee, Jesus is mine. All right. I'm sure you sang wonderful at your house. Uh, I was going to joke around that. I think I almost heard some of you, but uh, I won't do that. All right. Take your Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter number 3. And uh, we're finishing off today with our series uh, about the churches in Revelation and uh, the last church in the cities. All right. This is the last one here this morning. And uh, as we've gone through this series, <clears throat> we've seen some churches that had some good things going, but there were some things the Lord wasn't happy about. And then uh, last week we saw Church Philadelphia. I mean, they were on the money. The Lord was so pleased with them, had no words of, you know, you need to change or anything. He comes to this church, and it's not a good scene. It's, it's not. And uh, I think there's some good things for us to learn, to apply and watch out for in our personal life and even in our church life we we need to be always watching out that's something that never stops and just as we start just a reminder that these letters were written to real churches <clears throat> these again not symbolic it's real churches okay um and the scholars in the past have kind of you know put these churches uh mentioned here in these letters in different uh, time periods of church history and the Laodicean church uh, pictures the state of the church from about they say from 1900 until the, the rapture takes place that's what they're saying and uh it, it's it does when we look at this today we'll see that unfortunately many churches in our world today are like this one and it's a church that's apathetic and apostate in ways uh so just keep that in our mind as we go and as well, these uh, letters uh, speak to every Christian in every church. This, this is for you. Okay, this is for me. And uh, so a little background on Laodicea before we get too far. It's always helpful. Uh, and I think as we've gone through the series and we've done a little bit of a look at the city, it really helped us understand that letter means so much more to them because there was references to things that they knew about. So it really helps us understand it better too. Uh, the church was star, or sorry, the city was founded by Antigus II around uh, 250 BC, give or take, in that in around that time. It was located on a high plateau, uh, so it made it very easy to uh, be secured from enemy attack. One defensive problem that Laodicea had was that there was no ready water supply within the city. So they actually had created these large aqueducts that would bring in water. Uh, one to the north uh, was a hot springs. And uh, that was actually six miles of aqueduct would bring that hot water from the north and bring it into the city. And then uh, to the east was a place that we know as Colossae, which we know the book of Colossians was written to those folks in Colossae. And that was cold water. And that actually was 10 miles long aqueduct and it would bring in the cold water. That's an important fact. We'll get to that a little bit later. Um, Laodicea was destroyed by an earthquake at 61 AD. The city was so wealthy and so self-sufficient that they totally rebuilt the city on their own. The, the Caesar offered money, and they refused to no, we can take care of ourselves. Now, that's a rich city. All right. Now, there's three things that were really uh, three primary characteristics of the city. Uh, it was a center for banking, finances. It was known throughout the Roman Empire as a financial power. Okay, that was the name, you know, the thought of Laodicea, financial power in the secular realm. 
uh, fashion. It was renowned for soft black wool produced there. It was a luxury item. Uh, it was the place that you would go to find the latest fashions and newest styles would appear there. Can you imagine that even happened back then? Not the, just today, back then. All right. And in pharmaceuticals, uh, this was a, there was a famous medical school that was located within the city of Laodicea. It uh, produced a tablet. Uh, it was sold all over the Roman Empire. And this tablet was crushed and mixed with water, and then it became like a paste. And that paste was rubbed on people's eyes and supposedly helped cure some eye problems of that time period. So with that in mind, uh, let's look at the scriptures, all right? So uh, Revelation chapter number three, and I'm just going to read the first couple of verses uh, to this church, okay? Verse number 14, uh, Revelation uh, 3, verse number 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou were cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and I increase with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So Jesus comes to these people, uh, the Laodicean church. He has no good words to say, no words of, hey, good job, no words of compliment. He gets right to the situation and it wasn't good. He, he says the first thing, there's a problem with the possession. So the verse uh, 14, it says, uh, two of the church, sorry, and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. Now, words are always important. So he says, the church of the Laodiceans. In every other church that we have looked at, uh, out of the rest of them, there's only one that used, uh, in, all of them were used in, sorry, except for one. And that one said of Ephesus, the church of Ephesus. So again, the idea the church was located in that city. Here, it's not about the city. It's not the Lord's. It's the Laodiceans. It was their church, not the Lord's. He identifies a problem of possession. It was their church, and they did as they pleased. And it did not please the Lord. We must never forget why the church exists now i understand right now we're in a, a very unusual unprecedented time where we don't gather together as we have for eons uh, as a church uh it, but the reality is church does not exist as a platform to make us well known in our community or the world it's not a forum for us to advance our agendas or our ideas uh, it's not a place that we run or dominate. Uh, I understand the Lord has placed forth leadership and he's put forth rules for us to follow, but they're his, not ours, all right? And, and it's not our church. It's his. It's the Lord's church. He died for the church. He purchased this with his blood. In Acts 20, verse 28, it says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Spirit, our ghosts, have made you overseers to feed the ch uh, church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. He builds the church. He sustains the church. You can look at Matthew 16 and see that. Ephesus chapter 2 talks about it as well. The church exists for one purpose, his glory. That's why it exists. We're here for him and him alone. Not your church, not my church. It's the Lord's church. He's in. He's to be in possession of it. He's to be in control of it. That's it. Plain and simple. But the church in Laodicea was off track. The problem of passion, Jesus tells them in verse 15, uh, I know thy works and thou art neither cold nor hot. Uh, remember what I was telling you earlier about where the waters came from? Okay, so the water from that hot springs uh, six miles away was brought into the city by those aqueducts from the north. So even if it was piping hot when it came out of that hot spring, by the time it traveled that many miles in an aqueduct, it was not hot anymore. 
And then I told you about Colossi that had that colder spring. I mean, it actually traveled further than the hot spring. So by the time it got to Laodicea, guess what? It wasn't cold. It was lukewarm again. So when the Lord talked about this, the Laodiceans who read this were like, oh, we know exactly what he's talking about. Lukewarm water made getting refreshment, cool or even hot refreshment, in Laodicea difficult. It wasn't easy. The church had become lukewarm. That means they lost their passion for Christ. They become indifferent, apathetic. Uh, <clears throat> they're just going through the motions. They were not moved by the Lord. All right. Apparently, apparently they were indifferent towards the cross of Jesus. And uh, these folks did not have a hot passion for Christ. And, and neither were they totally dead. They were in this icky in-between stage that made Jesus sick. Uh, it's, I mean, this condition that he talks about here, unfortunately, does remind us of so many churches today in our modern age. People are just going through the motions. There's no burning passion for the things of the Lord. You know, unfortunately... The average church today is a study of apathy. They're not exactly dead. There, there's still prayers being said. There's still preaching happening. There's singing occurs, etc. But they're not on fire. There's no excitement. There's no passion for though uh, about serving the Lord and uh, and what they're hearing, what they're supposed to do. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the modern day churches today is uh, enter the church take a seat, fold our arms, and bless me if you can type of attitude. And I'll be honest, I have preached to crowds like that in the past. Bless me if you can. Arms crossed. And again, that's not necessarily a bad thing that you sit down and have crossed your arms. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that, but just the attitude uh, concerning that. They, they never feel they need to do anything. They never feel the need to get things right with the Lord. They never feel the need to maybe go to an altar or get things right. They never feel need to do anything but one thing, come and go. I come to church, check. I gave, check. You know, no, it's way more than that. I, I certainly don't expect everyone to respond the way I would. Now, I can be kind of loud on occasion. I've been accused of something. Well, no, it's not accused. I am. All right. Uh, I can get kind of excited. Uh, but... I mean, we all should show some sort of emotion, some sort of uh, reaction to the Lord and what he would have for us to do. The emotions do show life. All right. We need to show some evidence that the word of God is impacting us. The word of God is doing that. Where's your passion for the Lord? And that's a question for you. If you know Christ is Savior, where's your passion? How is your passion for the Lord? There's a problem of, uh, of how they see themselves, a perception problem. And these people in Laodicea looked at themselves in verse 17 because they'll say, I'm rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing. I, we're good. That's what they said. Uh, they looked at all their possessions and all the things they had. And were like, we've arrived. I mean, if every church could be as good as us, it would be great. And they sat there in their church. I mean, I don't know if they actually had a building, but the idea here is that they, they, were, they were unmoved. They thought they were in great shape. The problem is that attitude is based in blindness. Jesus tells them they're totally wrong. And they're nowhere where they need to be. They're far from it. And today many churches are in that same kind of mindset. Their attitude is as similar as the, as the Laodiceans. And they're heading the right, wrong way. And I, and I pray that our church never goes that direction. And we always need to be constantly guarding our hearts to make sure we're not. Now, it's sad, but there's some churches who get more excited about money in the bank than they do about people getting saved and believers doing what they should for Jesus Christ. That's sad. I understand that money is necessary to do things, to buy things, pay salaries. I get that. But it's not about the money. It's about the message being proclaimed and lives being changed by Jesus Christ. Now, I have never had this experience, but I have watched enough of May Day shows to know that when... A plane stops going forward. When it loses its pro propulsion, it starts to go down. I hope I never experienced that in real life. All right. 
and it starts going down. Now, often the uh, event of going down all the way does not end well for everybody on the plane. And the same can be said of the true of the church. But when the church stops moving forward for Jesus Christ, it, it loses its sense of purpose and stops being passionate for Christ and doing what we're supposed to. It stops. It's going to go down. And the landing won't be good. It'll be rough. Let's make sure that we're not in that category, that we are moving forward for Jesus Christ. Uh, as well, we see uh, the, the Lord says the church is in trouble, but not all hope is lost. Uh, he talked about how he's, uh, back in verse 14, uh, these things saith the amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. He comes as a confirming one. Amen. Every preacher loves to hear amen when he's preaching, all right? Not, not continuously amen, but when he strikes home a point, the preacher, his, the idea is that you're, you're affirming, you're saying it is so. That's what the word means. It's so be it, let it be so, or it is so, all right? When that's when we pray, we, we say amen, let it be so. Uh, we're praying for our military and, and asking the Lord to give them encouragement and to guide their hearts at this time of loss amen let it be so praying for folks in our church who are sick and we say amen let it be so lord all right it's a word of uh, of confirmation and he's saying i am amen I am. it's a word of confirmation finality i am the amen and, and when jesus comes to church he comes as god's final word to humanity you find that in hebrews chapter 1 verse 2. he comes as the confirmer of all god's promises for all the promises of God in him are yea, and in, in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us, 2 Corinthians 1.20. He comes as the confronting one. He also comes as the faithful and true witness. This church, the Laodicean church, had a problem with vision. It didn't see its problem. And Jesus wants to know that he sees them truly as they are. There's no hiding it. And he comes, hey, the beginning, the creation of God. He identifies Jesus in this letter as the creator and controller of all things. And he comes to this church and reminds them, uh, I'm in charge. You're not. In, in spite of all what you might think, I am in charge. The Lord. He's still at the helm. And he's the one who's in control. It would do us well to remember those things too. Just not the lady to see in church. We need to remember. He's the one who knows us better than ourselves. We can deceive ourselves, can't deceive God, can't deceive Jesus Christ. And he's in control. Now for us, that should be a great encouragement this morning as we're going through unprecedented times that the Lord's in control. Praise the Lord. He's in control. Amen. I, I, I let it be so. I, I'm glad he is. And then he comes as well and he says, uh, well, in verse 15, the latter part, uh, I, I would that work cold or hot. That's the Lord's desire. Be, be one. Yeah, I mean, come on, let's do something here, folks. Uh, the water situation in Laodicea, I already talked about that, reflected the church. And by that time, the water from the north and from the east came. It wasn't cold or hot anymore. It wasn't cold anymore. Lukewarm. Ugh, horrible. Didn't provide any refreshing quality at all. Jesus tells the church, I wish you were cold or hot. I wish you were one. I wish you were excited uh, for me. And uh, and like, who, who doesn't like to go to a hot spring and enjoy the heat? I mean, come on. That's awesome. That, that he is just that heat, uh, excitement for Jesus Christ. And, and even if you were cold, you were not where you should be. The Lord can revive us back to where we should be. I think, too, that cool water on a hot day. How refreshing is that? I mean, oh, so good. So he, he said, I got a desire for you. I wish you weren't either one of these. And he, he talks about how he, he's not happy with this. You know, I'll spew thee out of my mouth. This word spew is a strong word. It, it means to vomit. It means to throw up. Uh, you know, Jesus tells him, you're like drinking from a lukewarm water. And if I consume it, it makes me sick. And he's not tolerating this indifference and apathy anymore. He wants things to change because he's in control. He has that authority to make these expectations on these people, on this church. 
and verse the latter part of verse 17, he confronts the first part where they say, well, we're rich, uh, increase with goods, and need nothing. I mean, the Lord totally dismantles that in this verse, uh, the latter part of it. And he says, then those now that thou art wretched, miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. They were proud of their accomplishments, and Jesus calls them wretched, which means troubled, and miserable. It means to be pitied. They thought they were something else. The Lord looks at them and says, you're miserable. You need to be pitied. You're, you guys are not even close to what you should be. And they were so proud of their wealth. I mean, remember, they were the financial center, one of the financial centers in the Roman Empire. I mean, that's a big deal. And he says, you're poor. You're poor. You're destitute, it means, that idea of poor, reduced to begging. That's not what they thought they were. And they were proud of the vision of themselves. And Jesus tells them, you're blind. You can't see. Someone said, there's no one uh, so blind as he who will not see. It's a good statement. That they will not see. They, those individuals there did not. They are proud of their fashions, their fine clothing. Jesus says, you're naked. And they're totally exposed. And he comes to them with some spiritual value in verse 18. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, and thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, and thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye save, and that thou mayest see. He tells his church that this is what he wants to see. This is, this is Come to me for these things. Come for spiritual value. If they would come to him and put him first in their life, then they would know true riches. He, call, he tells them to come, and you know th those other treasures, they would disappear, but these are the important ones. These ones will you last, uh, lay up for eternity's sake. We see that in Matthew chapter 6 and 1 Peter 1. He comes to them for spiritual clothing as well. He invites them to the door themselves in spiritual raiments and garments. You know, this is an invitation to salvation as well. They're naked and lost in their sins. Come to me. If they come to him, he'll robe, uh, clothe them in robes of righteousness. And they'll be no longer naked and exposed in the sight of God. Uh, Isaiah 61, 10, uh, latter part of the verse says, For he hath clothed me the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. He says, come, and, and I'll do this. Come for a vision. Uh, th th there's no way that these people missed the analogies of their city and what they were famous for and with this church. Okay, He invited them to come so he could restore their vision. When that spiritual vision is restored, they'll be able to see themselves as they are and able to see Jesus Christ as who he is. And this would lead to repentance. This would lead to obedience and lead to service. Hey, we all need to make sure that our spiritual vision is 2020, hey, where it should be. Why were the people dry and indifferent spiritually? Because they couldn't see themselves for who they were and they didn't see the Lord as who he was. Aren't you glad the Lord can open the blind eyes? Luke 4, 18 is a great verse. It says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is the Lord beginning his ministry, and he's talking to those about him, because he have anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Isn't, I mean, I love that. that. That's why I came, to heal the brokenhearted. How many people do we know that are brokenhearted? Jesus is the answer. To preach deliverance to the captives. We know so many people captive in sin. And recover of sight to the blind. To set at liberty them that are bruised. Oh, what a great verse. Uh, so the reality is Jesus comes to, for spiritual vision. Come to me and, and, hey, I'll give you these things. And he comes with some advice, too. It's a wonderful thing to see. He invites them to come to him, and he gives them uh, a word of compassion. As many as I love in verse 19. In spite of the indifference toward him, he still loves them. What a blessing. Jesus doesn't write people off that, that don't please him right away. I mean, the Lord is gracious. He is full of mercy. Uh, definitely a lesson for all us believers that we should have that same kind of long suffering to help those who need Christ. But he calls them to love. The Lord says, I love you. Now, there's a word of caution, too. I rebuke and chasten. I love you, but I rebuke and chasten. 
Uh, Jesus tells them that just because he loves them like he is, he loves us also to make, make us leave what we were and, and to help us along to turn away. And he uses two methods here. Rebuke means to convict or to correct. He speaks to us in our condition and he, and he sends his word and it convicts our hearts through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's found in John chapter 16. And if we come to him, when the Holy Spirit works in our heart like that, he'll he'll definitely receive us. He won't turn us away. And if we fail to heed his rebukes, he'll use a more direct method. He will chasten. It means to correct with blows. And now this is definitely referring to uh, the saved individual who's away from the Lord, not doing as he should. Uh, uh, he, he's going to touch your life to get attention. Christian, if you're far away from the Lord, not doing as you should, the Lord is going to press on your heart and life. He, he's going he's to bring your attention. And maybe the events taking place right now in our world have caused you to stop and say, man, what am I doing with my life? Am I, I'm, I'm not doing what I should. Maybe there's things I need to take care of. This is the time. Maybe the Lord's using this to rebuke you. You know, and, and another portion of scriptures, we see the Lord even uses death to get a hold of people's hearts and lives, those who will not. I find reference to that in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 30. Those who refuse to walk in God's path, you're going to, if you refuse, if you continually to say, no, I won't, no, I won't, I'll do it my way, I'll do it my way, I uh, yes, I've accepted Christ as Savior, but he doesn't know what's best for my life. If you continue down that path, as did the Laodiceans, you're going to, you're, you're going to encounter, you're going to face trouble. Uh, just totally truth from God's word. Proverbs 13, 15, it says, Good understanding giveth favor, but the way of the transgressor is hard. It's not easy. It's hard. So, believer, let's make sure that we're on the right track, that we're just not doing our own thing and making sure that our vision is on the Lord, that we have the right view of ourselves and the absolute correct view of God. Word of counsel, be zealous, therefore, and repent. The word zealous means to burn with zeal. The idea that the church needs to get on fire for Jesus. And when they see their need and turn to him, it will be manifest in gen genuine repentance, turning away. That's the idea of repentance. I was going one way. I changed my mind. I was headed this way. And because of the change of mind, it results in a change of direction. I'm going the other way. I have done wrong, Lord. Now I need to do what's right. All right. If the Laodiceans were to repent, they would come alive with the Lord, and he would use them. And we need to hear that same message today. Um, let's not fool ourselves to think that we're so much better than the Laodiceans. We are no better. They are just as like you and me. And we need to make sure that we are not out of God's will and we're not drifting into that apathy. We need to make sure we need to ask the Lord to let us see ourselves as we really are. We need to be able to see who he is and get fired up and get excited about serving Jesus Christ. That's not going around and you're being crazy and you're yelling all the time. No, no, I'm not talking about that. But there is a passion in your heart and life about Jesus. And who he is and what he's doing. And that kind of dump that apathy and uh, and repent of that indifference and look to the Lord. The promise to the Laodiceans in verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. He that have an ear, let him hear. But the Spirit saith unto the churches. He comes, as he closes this letter uh, to this church, he comes with a promise. This church in Laodicea, unfortunately, uh, from everything we see, kind of evicted the Lord from the church. And he's trying to gain answer, access again, a mission. He, he says, I stand at the door and knock. It's, it's a promise. I'm there. I'm there knocking at the door. His effort to get back in this church, Jesus stands there and he knocks. And the idea here is he's continuously knocking. He's just not like, knock, knock once and he's out. No, he wants admission into the church. He, he, he In this church here in Laodicea, he wants to be a part of the individual members who make up the church. He wants to be part of their lives. 
He never gave up in that effort. I'm glad he doesn't give up on us. He says, if any man hear my voice and open the door, Jesus is a gentleman. He's not busting through the door. He will not break down the door. It must be opened by ourselves. We act on that will. We let him in in the sense, yes, I want to sup with him. I want that passion renewed. I want to serve Jesus Christ. I don't know if you've ever seen the picture. It's pretty famous. It's painted by Holman Hunt. Uh, it's a picture of the Lord standing by a door, out, uh, outside a door with a little light in his hand, and he's knocking on the door. And through in that painting, you see a man looking through a window out at the door. And uh, when he finished that painting, a man looked at it, <clears throat> and uh, he said, you made a mistake. Don't you love those people? You know, you, you work hard at something, and the first thing they do is criticize it. Oh, it's so great. Um, but at any rate, he says, and Hunt was very uh, gracious about it. He goes, well, what, what, where did I make mistakes? Show me. He, the critic said, you forgot to paint a handle on the outside of the door. You forgot to do that. And Hunt responded, I hope he smiled. I don't know if he did, but I hope he smiled. And he said, there's no mistake. The handle is on the inside. Jesus knocks. You must open the door. You must open the door. And, and the idea of letting him in is a sup with him and, and he with me. The, apparently, uh, the ancient Greeks uh, would have three meals a day. Well, we do that too, maybe even more, especially in quarantine. It might be six meals a day. Uh, but at any rate, three meals a day, uh, large breakfast, kind of a smaller lunch, and then uh, supper was uh, evening leisurely uh, meeting with the family as such supper that's what they call it sup with him supper time to get, to get together and it was a time to talk it was a time yes obviously to eat uh, but it's a time of fellowship and jesus says i will if you open the door i'll come in i want to fellowship with you i want to i want to spend time with you what an amazing savior that he would die for us who are worthless, unworthy of what he has done for us. And he said, I want to fellowship with you. I want to spend time with you. you know, I, I want to come together and just be with you. That is amazing. That is what amazing Savior. And the, the converted person, the one who knows Jesus Christ as Savior, uh, can identify that this is Jesus. He loves me. He cares about me. And one day the promise is that you will sit with me in heaven as I am with my father. You will be too. That's a promise for the saved individual. That's a powerful promise. So where does this message find you today? <clears throat> it's May the 3rd, right? Beautiful day outside. Wonderful, you know, that you get to enjoy some warm temperatures. Life is really upside. Things are not the way you want them to be right now. Who wants to be in quarantine for about 48 days or whatever it is now? Where does the message find you? Are, are you feeling a little hopeless? Do you know Christ as Savior? I, I'm thrilled to tell you that uh, you can receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. There was Laodiceans who needed Christ as Savior. There's Canadians, whoever you are, from whatever part of the world you are watching, later now, whatever, that need Jesus Christ. Now, I needed Jesus Christ. I wasn't in trouble with the law. I wasn't running with a bad crowd. Uh, I wasn't uh, in any kind of trouble that way. I didn't have any addictions or anything like that. I was trying to live a good, clean life. I was trying to do it my way. I'm so glad the Lord convicted me of my sin. And Romans 3.23, for all of sin comes short of the glory of God. The Lord uh, convicted me that, Mark, you're a sinner. And even though I was trying to be good and trying to be a good lad and a young man, uh, you know, at 19 years old, I was trying to do what was right. I was still guilty of sin. I wasn't perfect. No one is. I understood that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. There's a consequence for my sin, death. And that death is referring to just not the physical death. It's referring to spiritual, eternally separated from God in hell listen folks you can't believe there's a heaven and say there is no hell there is a heaven and there is a hell but god commends his love toward us in that while we were sinners christ died for us 
as Romans 5 8. Jesus paid the penalty. Understood I was lost. I was, you know, I was a sinner. I was headed to a crisis eternity. But God came in his love toward us, towards me, towards you, wherever you are today. Jesus paid the penalty. He demonstrated his love. And it's amazing love. It's amazing grace. Romans 10, 9, if thou shalt believe, uh, confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thy heart that God have raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. If you would confess and trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you're saved. And the idea here that you know, if you confess and trust in Christ, that means you're turning from whatever you were. I talked about repentance a few moments ago. You're, you're changing your mind. This is not the way. That's what happened to me when I was 19 year old. I, I realized that. What I was doing was not the right way. I repented. I when I trusted Christ as Savior at that very moment, confessed him as Savior. It was no longer this. It was now Christ. That's who it is. The decision for Christ changed my life. Absolutely. I'm pretty sure I wouldn't be here on this screen with you right now if I hadn't made that choice. I would urge you to make that choice. Accept Christ as Savior. Now, you're watching this and you, and you say, Pastor Mark, I made that decision for Christ. Well, wonderful. Praise the Lord for that. Where's your commitment for the Lord? How is it, I should say? Are you serving the Lord? Are you zealous about it? Are you fired up about serving Jesus Christ? Do you have that passion in your heart and life? Or maybe you're kind of apathetic. You're indifferent. And even now, as I'm preaching, you're like, eh, whatever. He's almost done. Hey, it's not, I might be done in a few moments, but the Lord's not done. He has a plan for your life, and it'd be extremely wise for you to get plugged into that plan. Do what God wants for you. He's standing at, he's standing out. Are you, you got the Lord out of your own fellowship? Have you kind of pushed him to the side, doing your own thing? Oh, believer, get that right. Yeah, and I'm not talking about you can't lose your salvation. You're always part of the family of God. Absolutely. But you can push him out and crowd in all kinds of other things in your heart and life. Hey, push those things out in and bring Jesus back in. Hey, make sure that door is open. and that You're not throwing out the Lord. You're bringing him in. He wants our fellowship. He desires it. Think about that. The creator of the world desires fellowship with you. With you. With me. And this is not once a month or once a week or once every 20 days. No, all the time. Does he have that fellowship with you? You're the only one who can answer that question. I hope that we will never go down the path of the Laodicean church. If we're going to make sure our church never goes down that path, that means as individual believers, members of our church, you need to make sure that you're not apathetic. And that you're not indifferent to whatever the Lord would have. Dear Jesus, thank you for this time. And Lord, I pray that we could learn much from the church of the Laodiceans. Uh, they did so many things not that weren't right. Uh, Lord, help us to learn from their mistakes. And Lord, help us to be on fire for you. Let's have that passion for you and your word. We need it, and you desire, Lord, allow us to have that sweet fellowship with you. Lord, allow, to have that uh, sup, that supper, the idea of just continuous fellowship, time, investment in you. Lord, I pray you just help us. Thank you for what you have done and what you will do. We look to you to guide and direct. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have any questions about the messages you've heard or the message this morning, or maybe you've watched ones in the past, you can't quite understand it, uh, you know, reach out to us. We'll try our best to answer them. We want to be encouragement to you as you walk your spiritual life. Uh, we, want, we want you to know Jesus Christ as Savior. That is the greatest thing. Uh, but as believers, uh, hey, we're here to help. We're here to encourage. Uh, so keep that in mind. Reach out to us via Facebook here, or email. Uh, you can phone us as well. Uh, we we want to be a blessing. So just some reminders. <clears throat> Tonight, uh, 5 p.m., uh, we will continue our series in Daniel. 
Read chapter three of Daniel. Maybe go outside if you got a patio, a backyard. Bring out that cup of coffee or a cool, refreshing iced tea and read it out there. All right. Daniel chapter three this afternoon. Get ahead, read, and it'll help you as we study it tonight. And I would encourage you to uh, kind of look back a little bit. There might be another quiz. All right. About what we've learned already. Uh, folks, have a great afternoon. Enjoy your day. Enjoy the sunshine. Uh, enjoy the warmer temperatures. And uh, but keep keep exploring the book. Don't stop, and keep looking to Jesus. All right, we'll see you at five.